But I want you to think of a time where these, the mountaintop experiences in your life, and it feels like nothing can go wrong. And then all of a sudden, it seems like everything's going wrong. And there is one attack after another attack after another attack in your life. How do you tend to respond? And so what we want to look at tonight is David. David is going through something exactly like that. You know, if you read 2 Samuel, we got a chance to preach through 2 Samuel. And if you remember when we were there, it just seemed like David was having one victory after another victory after another victory. So the background I want you to think about this week is 2 Samuel chapter 8. And in 2 Samuel chapter 8, you're going to find that David is having one victory after another, after another, after another. And you don't ever hear in 2 Samuel of defeats with him. But this is about a defeat. And if it weren't for the sovereignty of God through his Holy Spirit, we would never have known about this defeat. But what we're going to read in Psalm 60 is about a defeat that David was dealing with. And David is experiencing this amazing problem. And he's just like, you know, what do I do about it? And I wonder for me and for you, what do you do? And what do I do when we go through these high points in our lives? And then it feels like it's one wave after another, after another crashing over you. So let's, let's look at Psalm 60. Let's read through it together. And then let's spend some time trying to learn what David did in the midst of his struggles. Uh, What you're going to see is a pretty long superscription here. Um, In fact, the superscription, that's the one, that's the section just above uh, the verses, is the longest of David's, uh, any of David's writings. Um, So the superscriptions usually give the historical context of what's happening with the Psalms. So if you see that, it will tell you what's happening. And what was happening was that there was a battle that was happening, and David was out at battle, and then all of a sudden, this foreign enemy is going to kind of sneak in and try to get to Jerusalem because David was pretty far away from Jerusalem at the time. Then David hears about this enemy coming, and then he sends Joash to, um, to fight this battle for him. And so he goes and fight uh, Joab to fight the battle for him. And he fought the battle and he struck down 12,000 um, people in the Valley of Salt. So that's where we see this opening here. So keep in mind, 2 Samuel chapter 8, spend some time reading through that. That's the superscription, but let's read the passage. Oh God, you've rejected us, broken our defenses. You've been angry. Oh, restore us. You've made the land to quake. You've torn it open. Repair its breaches for it totters. You've made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow, Selah. That your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer us. God has spoken in his holiness. With exultation, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the veil of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. Judah is my scepter. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom, I cast my shoe. Over Philistia, I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go forth, O God, with our armies. Oh, grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. With God, we shall do valiantly. It is he who treads down our foes. Okay, this is the sufficient, eternal, authoritative, life-giving, life-changing word of God. Let's pray here. So, Father, I thank you for uh, this, this wonderful passage of Scripture. Um, Father, in this passage, what we see is is your displeasure with your people and even your punishment of the rebellion against you. What we also see is not only your displeasure, but we see your love. Not only we see you seemingly abandoning them, but they are rescuing them. 
Now, Father, I pray that as that central verse, the banner, I pray that we would run to the banner as we run to the cross, as we run to your son, as we run to the gospel in the midst of the troubles and the trials and the difficulties of our lives. Rescue us today, Lord. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want you to think about when you go through those trials, how do you respond? So as I said, this background is found in 2 Samuel chapter 8. So spend some time uh, looking through that this week. That'll be good. And I call this the banner of God. You may have picked it up. And if you notice in verse 4, it's a pivotal verse there. We'll spend more time going back to it. But in verse 4, it says, You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow. So, so what David is saying is that in the midst of the violence, in the midst of the struggles, in the midst of the uh, chaos, he and the, and the people are running towards God. So um, this outline that I've laid out for you tonight hits a couple of high points, a couple low points. Um, it will start in verses one through three, that God has rejected the nations. Uh, then what we will see in verses one through three, so he has seemingly rejected this nation. Then you'll see that God, uh, the psalmist is going to voice his confidence in victory in God. That's verse four. That's the pivotal, pivotal verse that we just saw. Then David is going to cry out in prayer in verse five. Then we're going to see God's response, verses six through eight. And then David's going to tell us about two lessons that he learned in verses nine through 12. So God seemingly rejects the nation. David voices his confidence. He cries out in prayer. He receives God's response. And then he learns two lessons about trusting in God. So let's, let's spend some time uh, working through each one of those sections. So let's look at verses uh, one through three. And let's start with the fact that the psalmist claims that God has rejected the nation. And so I don't know if you've ever felt this way at times, but David was feeling that God had forget, forgotten him and forsaken him. I was sharing with a friend who's going through a really uh, challenging time, Psalm 13. And it's similar in Psalm 13. It's like, how long, O oh Lord? I think I actually mentioned it this morning. How long, O oh Lord? How long? You know, over and over again. So David is feeling that God seemingly is rejecting his people right now. And it says here that you, O oh God, have rejected us. Hold on one second. Let me just close that up. Uh, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. You have been angry with us. So, so David says that God is judging his people. And, you know, in many ways, as we look at our nation, I honestly believe that God is judging our nation as well. Um, maybe there have been times in your life where he, you felt like he was personally judging you. And if you notice these words, he has rejected us, he has broken down our defenses, and he seems angry with us. So David is recognizing that the people have done something and that God is upset with them in some way or another. It reminded me back, if you remember back in the book of Joshua, when um, the Israelites had gone into Jer uh, Jericho and God had said, do not take any of the spoils from Jericho. And if you remember, Achan went in there, took the spoils from Jericho. And then they had a small battle on uh, Ai, I believe it was. And afterwards at Ai, it was like uh, Joshua had sent out just a small group because he said, this is a small city. We should be able to take care of it. And they got routed. And then he cried out to God, why? Why are you doing this? And God says that there's sin in the camp. And then they found out that Achan had sold, uh, stole. I think in some ways it's similar. And so perhaps as you're going through times in your life where it feels like God is disciplining you and God is um, displeased with you in some way or another, I want you to think about, um, have you ever felt this way? I feel rejected, I feel broken down. I feel like God is angry. And God, what he is crying out for is that God would restore us. That God, I, I'm crying out that you will restore us. And that's a really important thing to do, that when we recognize sin by the work of the Holy Spirit, by his word, it's really important that we go back and cry out to confess that sin and repent of that sin. It's real important. God, restore us. It reminds me of um, Isaiah as well. Remember in Isaiah, he says that I am a man of unclean lips and I'm a people of unclean lips. And then he's confessing his own sin, but he's confessing national sin as well. David, in some ways, 
is doing something similar. So you have rejected us, Lord. In verse 2, he said this, you have made the land to quake. So now what David is going to now feel, he's going to give two powerful images. I want you to see these two powerful images. He says, you've made the land to quake. You've torn it open. It's breaches for it totters. He, he envisions an earthquake. I don't know if any of you have, have any of you been through an earthquake before? No. Okay. So we had a, we had a mild tremor here probably about seven or eight years ago. You're right. Yeah, absolutely. So I was in my home and the ground started to shake. Things were moving in the house a little bit. It was like, it was a, it was a, a tremor, tremor that we had had here probably about seven or eight years ago. So I was back in my house and I, I don't know. I mean, I've never been to a major earthquake, but if, if the foundation under you all of a sudden starts to move, it, it's, it creates a lot of damage and it can be pretty terrifying. And that's what David is saying that, you know, God, you're, you're allowing for this to happen. I do not know why. And he says, it almost feels as though the earth is quaking underneath. And so perhaps you've gone through that in your life. Perhaps you've gone through times where it feels like the earth is quaking underneath you and that you do not have a firm foundation. And David says that, but then David gives a second in verse three, he says this, you have made your people see hard things. You have given us what wine to drink, to make us stagger. So don't misunderstand. David is not saying that you are making us drunk, but he's in essence saying that because of our sinfulness, because you've allowed us to go down this path, you have given us this freedom to go and do this, that it is almost as if I have gotten so drunk that I am now staggering around. So it's not only that I'm just tottering in an earthquake, but now I am quaking back and forth and I'm staggering as though I'm drunk. I've been knocked on the head um, and I am feeling uncomfortable. And that's what was happening in the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was feeling really confident as David is winning battle after battle. And now this foreign enemy comes in and they are quaking and they are unstable. And so David sees that drunkenness as that image of that thing, that reeling from the attack. So, so once again, I want you to think about times in your life where it's like you were feeling so very confident. And then all of a sudden it feels like the foundation has moved or it almost feels like you're staggering and stumbling. And it's like, I was really confident. And then all of a sudden I've lost it. I found myself, um, slipping on ice, I think I may have mentioned, uh, probably two or three years ago. I walked out. I walked somebody out to their car. I was really confident as I walked them out to their car. I ran back into my office and I remembered I forgot something in my car. So I went out. I was not as con I was not, I was probably too cocky instead of um, sit careful. And I hit the ice and then all of a sudden I was on my back and I was gone. I was down already very quickly. And perhaps that's the way you feel at times when you walk out feeling pretty confident and then all of a sudden, wham, you're falling on your back. Well, David says that that's what he feels like. So he begins by saying that God seemingly has rejected the nation. And then he goes to this. He says, now the psalmist uh, voices confidence. And this is what really amazes me about David. But David, in the midst of the trials and in the midst of feeling like the earth is tottering and staggering back and forth, David placed his confidence in victory in God. And you see this in verse four, it says, you have set up a banner for those who fear you. So he's got this banner and, you know, I've never been in battle, but um, I used, I love the civil war. I love research in the civil war. And I don't know if they do this now as much as they did back then because of the communication um, abilities that we have today, but the way that they would rally their army is around the flag. You would see the flag and you would run to the flag. So if the flag was moving forward, you would do to, uh, run after that flag. And it was actually a great honor to hold that flag, but it was also an opportunity to die. I mean, a lot of people would shoot at the person holding the flag because they figured that they create some level of disorder. Well, it's David is saying that as, you know, as the battle is happening, we need the person to raise the standard. We need the person to raise the banner. And he says that you're raising the banner for those who fear you. Uh, it's a rallying point. And David is saying that I want you to create a rallying point for us, God. We know that you do. And if you notice, it is for those that fear you. And as you've heard me say before, fear is not, um, is not dread. Fear for a believer is about reverence and worship and awe. 
So those that reverence you, instead of fearing humanity, we're fearing you. We're lifting you up, God. We're lifting you up in your uh, in our eyes, and we're running after that banner. We're running towards you. We're fleeing the bow, and we're running to the banner, which I find really interesting. That David says that is where we need to flee. So I guess the question would be, what is the banner? And for us, I believe the banner is the gospel. The banner is the place where we run to the good news, that we're hearing all this bad news about the battle. We're feeling like we're tottering. We're feeling like we're staggered. What's the good news? Christ is one. And I am part of his victory. And I can run after him. I can run after a banner that will never totter, that will never falter, that will never fail. And that's where David is able to go in the midst of the struggles in his life. He's able to go back to confidence in knowing that, God, you are with me. You will never leave me. You will never forsake me. And that's why I believe that he puts the seal in there. He says, I want you to take some time. I want you to pause. I want you to think. I want you to consider. Sila, we, we're not completely sure of, but we believe it is a musical notation just to take a pause. And so I want you to take a pause at all of the battles and all the struggles and all the trials and all the troubles and all the difficulties that you're having. I want you to take a pause at times to, to think, okay, God, are you displeased with me? Is there something in my life that I need to confess? Then then run to God and ask for his forgiveness and ask him to uh, restore you and then have confidence in the fact that the banner, the good news, that he may not be happy with us as a father, but he will never be our judge ever again, our ultimate judge for eternity ever again. That for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he judges us righteous in his sight. And for us as a child, you know, just like a father gets upset with a child at times because we want to see them do right, God at times gets upset with us so that we will do right as well. But remember the banner, the good news, the gospel. You're loved, you're forgiven, you're free. So take that pause and just to think deeply about that and consider it. So when you're feeling so discouraged, consider it deeply. Okay, so now David moves to the, uh, his third step. The psalmist now cries out in prayer. And David often does this, that as he is identifying the problem, then he remembers truth, and then he calls out to God in prayer, and he does that here in verse 5. He says that your beloved, that we are your beloved, he's remembering who he is, be maybe delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer us. David is, is in essence saying that I want you to hear me, God. And the NIV version says this, save us and help us with your right hand that those who you love may be delivered. So David, it's very clear in the NIV that he's calling out to God and he's saying, save us, help us by your right hand because you love us, deliver us. And so once again, as we heard Pastor Doug preach this morning from Ephesians 3, God's love is limitless, and his love does not change for his believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so David is pleading to a God who loves his people that, they de- that he delivers us by his powerful right hand and answers us. So it's real important for us to pray. It's sad to me that prayer has become such a... Um, small thing in Christians' lives today and a small thing in Christian churches. Prayer is such a vital tool, and it's a, it's a major tool, a weapon in the Christian arsenal. And I pray that you are praying individually, but we also need to be praying corporately. And David um, spends a lot of time in prayer. So he recognizes that God is displeased. He um, recognizes that God is his banner that he's running to, and then he cries out to him in prayer. Next, David does this. He receives God's response. It's really important. So for us as believers, I believe that the primary way we communicate to God is through prayer. We speak to him through prayer, and the primary way that God speaks to us is through his word. And so that's how you have the communication chain. I cry out to God in prayer. God speaks to me through his word, more prayer, more word. And so that's why it is so important to have those two elements in your life taking in God's word and then crying out to him in prayer. So God gives him his response in verses six through eight. And he begins by saying this, God has spoken in his holiness. 
So um, you'll see on your notes that there's a translation question here. Um, is he talking about holiness? Some think that he may be talking about um, the temple or the tabernacle at the time. Um, others have it translated that it could be the sanctuary that he's in. Um, so there's a translation question here, what he means by holiness. I, I believe that David has gone into the book. He's gone into his scripture and God has spoken to him in his holiness, the Holy scripture. Um, but some would have some questions about that. So whatever it is, he's going to the sanctuary, he's going to the tabernacle and he's here. He's either getting a special revelation from God personally or he's going to God's revelation in the word and he's hearing God speak to him in the word. I believe that it's the second one. I believe that he's hearing God through the word, but God is speaking to him in his holiness. And he says, with exaltation, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the veil of Sukkoth. And so Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. Judah is my scepter. You will hear God speak. He says, Moab is my wash basin. It's like I use Moab like a wash basin. Edom, I cast my shoe over Philistia. I shout in triumph. What God is saying to him is that, David, you've got to remember who your God is. And we have to do the same thing that God recognizes that um, God is trying to get David to recognize that God is God. God's promises are true. He will never leave his children. He loves them, even though he chastens them at times, and he will always fight his children's enemies. And so David is given a history lesson. And each one of these places is so important. Shechem is important because if you go back into Genesis chapter 33, it is the place that J uh, Jacob settled when he was spending time with his father-in-law, Laban. So Shechem, it's, if you want to start Jacob, if you want to start David, let's go back to Jacob. Let's go back to the patriarch. And the land that I gave Jacob at the time, I want you to know that I gave him that land. Then I gave also the land of Sukkoth. It was the last place that they were in in Genesis chapter 33. So he went from Shechem to Sukkoth, and he says, these are two places on the eastern and western side of the river. And if you take the Jordan River and you go to the eastern and western side, God, God is saying to David, I've given you that land, both of those. Then he talks about Gilead, two other places that represent the eastern and western side. Then he gives him Gilead. He's a much larger area, which is in the center. And he says that I've given you Gilead and Manasseh, uh, Manasseh. It's the larger areas in the eastern side of the Jordan. And it's occupied by Israel at the time of uh, Judah's con uh, Joshua's conquest. And so he's saying this, that I've given you the eastern side. I've given you the middle. I've given you, I've given you even Ephraim. I've given you Judah, the most prominent tribes to the west. I've given you all of it. And so in essence, I, honest, I believe what God is doing is giving David a history lesson. You know, instead of a new word today about a new thing today, he just says, this is who I've been. I have this phrase I use with my people. I, I say that I can't, he can. He has, he does, he will. I can only in him. I can't. If I can recognize my inability without God, but he can, God can, he has passed. He is right now. He will in the future. I can only in him. Now, if I can remind myself that I can only do this in him, that's in essence what I believe God is doing. God is reminding David of their early history of Israel, that God has been faithful to them and has expanded their territories. And then he's expanded their territories through David. And he says, I am that God who is not going to leave you, David. What an important theme that we need to hear. And then David goes in the last portion here. The psalmist learns two vital lessons about trusting in God. And you and I need to hear these two lessons. Uh, verse, verse 9, it says, who will bring me to the fortified city? Uh, this fortified city is Petra, and it seemed impregnable. And so as people looked at this fortified city, they say, there is no human being that can get to that land. 
And David is saying, in essence, who will bring me to the fortified city, to this Petra? It's impregnable. Who will lead me to Edom? Who's going to actually help me to conquer this? And David's going to answer his own question because he's going to learn lesson number one. It's only God that can ever give you victory. See, even the high points that I've had in my life or the high points that you've had in your life, God gave those to you. And he's the same God that was with you when you felt like you were tottering or you felt staggered. He's the same God. The banner is the same. And so God is the one that's going to give you the victories. God is the one that is going to be with you and stretch you in ways that you can't imagine. So it's only God who can give you the victory. And David learned that lesson. David says, you know what? I am fighting these battles. And then I've got this enemy who's trying to flank me. But God, you've told me about this. And you've allowed me to uh, rescue my people because you are the one that gives victory. So that's one key lesson that David learns. But there's a second one that I want you to see. In verse 10 and 11, it says this. Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go forth, O God, with our armies. And then he says this, oh, grant us help against the foes, for vain is the salvation of man. David recognized that I can trust in chariots, I can trust in armies, but ultimately chariots and armies will let me down. People will let you down. God ultimately will not. He says that you're the only one that's going to bring me salvation. To trust in humanity is a vain opportunity. Well, we see that throughout scripture. You know, Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the Lord of the Lord. And in this law, does he meditate day and night? He's like a tree planted by rent waters. Uh, Jeremiah took on the same thing. He says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man, who makes man his strength. Throughout scripture, we find that those who trust in human beings and horizontal are going to be disappointed, are helped comes from the Lord. God is our only victory. But then it leads to the second lesson, that we must trust confidently in God and his help. It's not only that our victory can only come from the Lord, we must trust confidently that God is the one that's going to help us. We must run to him, and we must follow after him, hard after him. It's so important, but we, we spend our lives trying to fix it on our own. A problem comes up, And when do we go to him in prayer? And when do we run after the banner? More often than not, we try to fix it ourselves, and we fail more often times. So God is the only one that's going to bring you the victory, but God is the one that we have to confidently trust in. We need to call out to him and pray to him for his help. Help me, help me, help us. Because with God, we shall do valiantly. It is he who treads down our foes. It is God who is going to do this for you and for me. Leopold said this in his commentary. The psalm closes on a strong note of confidence, which was engendered by the promises of God, which were grasped in faith. You know, I was uh, talking to, uh, texting a friend who's going through uh, trouble right now. And, um, They were saying that, in essence, people were just kind of dropping verses on them and then just leaving. You know, it's like, here, just take this John 3.16 and call me in the morning. And promises are, are good, but they have to be applied appropriately. And they have to be grasped in faith. You can give a verse to anybody that you want, but in the final analysis, you need to be able to share it well, apply it appropriately, And then hopefully that they're going to grasp it in faith. I think I said last week that preaching is about proclamation. It's about explanation. And then it's about application. We proclaim something like Pastor Doug did today, or I'm doing now. I'm proclaiming something. I'm trying to explain it. That's the explanation piece. And then we want to try to help you to apply it. That's what real preaching is hopefully going to do. And so It's not only knowing the promises of God, it's being able to grasp them by faith. So where's the gospel here? Well, I think I've already told you that the gospel is found pretty clearly in the fact that Christ is our banner. That this disillusioned child, David, is 
sharing out his complaints and he's saying, God, you, you seem like you've rejected us. God, it seems like you're defeating us. God, it seems like you're angry with us. And he's looking at the natural disaster setting happening around. And he's even looking at intoxication. And it's like, God, God, it just seems like you're causing us to not totter, not totter back and forth. And then he cries out to God and he says, Lord, I remember that you're my banner. And he remembers what he knew of the gospel. We know so much more of the gospel today. He knows about this. He prays in the midst of the conflict. He doesn't rush out and rashness. He is, goes to God and wants to hear from God's word. And then he wants to respond in appropriate ways. He, he starts to see with spiritual eyes that only the Holy Spirit could give him. And he starts to see past the human things and past the trials and troubles to the God that is with him and the God that is fighting for him. And so David recalls the sovereignty of God and David, David recalls the love of God. David recalls the presence of God. And in essence, Christ is our banner. He is who we were running to. And so I, I want you to know that he loves you with a never ending, never ending love. The Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 12, it tells us that God is like a father to his children. And when we do wrong, he is going to, he's going to discipline us. And any parent who loves his child is going to discipline them. And he disciplines them not to hurt and to harm them, but to bring about healing in their lives. And that's so important. So, so God is seeing the sin in his people's lives and he wants to discipline them. And David starts to see God for who he really is. He sees God in his love. He sees God in the gospel and he sees God's sovereignty. He sees God's wisdom. He sees God's love and he praises him for who he is. So now when we see God, that will often lead us to the issue of this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is true. Of, this is a verse actually written to believers. I don't know if you realize that, that we often take this verse and it's like, oh, well, this must be a non-believer, you know, confess your sins. God is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. But this is written to believers that, that as God is saying, I want you to cry out and confess your sins to me. And when you confess your sins to me, I am going to, I am faithful, I'm just, I will forgive you, and I will cleanse you. Now, the unrighteous standing that we have positionally has been done. We are not, we are standing no longer under that unrighteous standing, but practically, I am unrighteous. I do unrighteous deeds every day. And what God says is this, just like for a non-believer, they need to confess their sins and run to a faithful God. For a believer, we need to do this as well. We must repent. It's one of the things that we just do not do very often as believers. We must repent. And true repentance is, is about turning. It is about going one direction and we're turning a different way. That Achan, you stole, you need to confess that. And traumatic issues from one from the old testament on from the new testament of a person's sin which was going to bring trouble and trials to the group and that person was going to be killed because of their sin Achan in the old testament and you remember who it was in the new testament ananias and sapphira right so when we repent i need you to recognize a couple of things before we close true repentance includes confession I agree with God. You're right, God. I'm wrong. I sin, but it includes change. I need to be willing to change. I need to be willing to go a completely different direction. And David says that, you know, and I'm willing to go a completely different direction. And the change is real important because the change includes these elements. It's a change of mind. It's a change of desire, but it's a change of will. I'm going to go a completely different direction. You know this passage in Proverbs 28, 13? You can, do you know it? Because it tells us about two strategies for dealing with your sin before I close. The first strategy, look at the two strategies. He, whoever conceals his sin or his transgression will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will find mercy. 
We will either conceal our sin or confess our sin. Those are the two strategies. If you conceal it, if you cover it up, if you try to push it down, kind of like what Achan did, he hit the stuff in his tent. He was crying and concealed his sin, but God calls us to confess it. See, if you conceal your sin, you will not prosper. Achan, you think you're going to get away with this. You're not going to prosper. But if you confess it and forsake it, forsake means to turn, you will obtain God's mercy. And God calls us to, to confess every single day. And, you know, oftentimes I'll get this question, why am I supposed to confess if God has already forgiven me? I'm declared righteous. Why do I need, need to confess? Because there's a judicial part of your relationship with God that has been taken care of by God's gospel and justification. But there is a practical part of your life where you continue to sin every day. And if you sin every day, you need to be confessing every single day and working every single day to recognize that you have failed. Because we sin daily, we need to be repenting daily. Last one. Repentance is the attitude and action that must be repeated throughout your Christian life. Because the two strategies, I could either conceal or confess. And if I conceal, I'm not going to prosper. But if I confess it, I will find mercy. And that I need, because I sin every single day, I need to be repenting every single day. And repentance is not just of the actions that I do, but it's even the very attitude of my heart. And I need to be doing that every day. And when I do that, what God says is this, he's going to do a work in my life to remind me of the banner that I could run to. The banner is his cross. So when was the last time you confessed? When was the last time you truly repented? David recognized that some of the um, defeats that were happening were a byproduct of God's disappointment with his people. And he confessed it. He confessed it as the leader. He ran to the banner. He asked people to run to the banner. He trusted in that God who is the one that's going to give him the victory and the one that he can trust in confidently in prayer. Our rallying point should be Christ. And so when you have somebody that is going through troubles and trials, then, you know, help them to look and see, are there things in your life that you need to confess and repent of? And if there aren't, then, um, well, there always are. But if that's not what seems to be significant, encourage them with the cross. So if they've sinned, encourage them with the cross. If they haven't sinned clearly on this situation, encourage them with the cross. Encourage yourself with the cross day by day. Let that cross and let the banner be um, your hope, your healing, your peace, your joy. So, all right, well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your banner. It, it amazes me that you are the offended God. And before we had even done the offense, you knew it. You and your son and your spirit planned to send your son for us to rescue us. Lord Jesus, you planned to be our provider and you became our provider. You took on human flesh, which we are celebrating at this time of the season. And you walked here on earth and you lived righteously for us and you died in our place and you went to the grave and you rose victoriously by the power of your Holy Spirit. And you're resurrected and you were ascended and you were seated on high right now. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would praise you today for what you've done. Father, there are days in our lives that we feel like we're quaking. There are days in our lives where we feel like we're staggering. And at times it's because there is sin in our lives. Lord, help us to be humble enough to confess it and not conceal it. I pray that you would help us to be humble enough to run to your son's cross. And I thank you for the precious blood that covers our sin and that leads us to a righteous life. Thank you for the standing of righteousness that all of us as believers have. But I thank you for doing righteousness in our lives and through our lives, Lord. I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would continue to remind us of to run to prayer and to hear your word, run to prayer and hear your word, run to prayer and hear your word, and to know that you're the one that brings victory, and to know that we need to run confidently to you, and that you will be with us in our time of need. So praise you, Lord. 
thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' matchless, holy, and powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen.